Yeah, Tanner, the lizard will be broken. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we've never played this together before, so that's what we were kind of going over back there. Will the circle be unbroken? <laughs> Thank you. Will the circle be unbroken? Boy, I hope everybody hope everybody gets saved and gets to go. Amen. All right. Why don't you turn to a couple of places this morning? First Peter chapter number one. Let you find your place. Let you mark it. Be bad. Good to be back home. Good to be in God's house. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Let me find it over here. I have not marked it yet. Hebrews, James. Ah, oh, look at here. 1 Peter chapter number 1. These Bibles are sometimes hard to turn the pages. Amen. All right. I'm going to mark this one. Now, if you're there, turn to John chapter 20 been preaching out of John on Wednesday nights. So I'm going to step ahead a little bit and when we get back to this particular portion of Scripture then I'm going to deal with it in a different way. I enjoy preaching through books. God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You've got a lot of good people, saved people in churches and they have absolutely no idea of what the Bible says on certain things. So we're going to look at it uh, for a few minutes this morning. Again, I want to say, thank the Lord I'm home. Amen. I'm glad to be back. All right, I'm going to tie two portions of Scripture together uh, this morning. I think it will be a blessing and maybe a help to you. In chapter number 
Uh, one of Peter, we find its example found in John chapter 20, that where the story resides. So what I'm going to do is start in verse number 24, read through 29 of John chapter 20. A very familiar verse of Scripture, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with him when Jesus came. We, we find the example of a man missing the house of God the week before. You say, well, I didn't miss much. I'll tell you, you always miss when you miss the house of God. And he missed the house of God. Now, he's going to get a bad rap. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. The Lord appeared to them on that Sunday, that first day of the week, the week prior, as when he came through and... Uh, uh, introduced himself to them all over again. They didn't have to open the door, open the window. He had a heavenly body. We'll have one one day too. You won't have to worry about something being open or shut. You'll be able to move probably with the thought. I'm talking about God's going to give you a heavenly body. So he said, we, we've seen the Lord, but he said unto them. They said, hey Thomas, we saw the Lord. He said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, Put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. You got some people got to see something before they believe it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we find here that he said, I'm not going to believe. Look at verse 26. And after eight days again. His disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I see. I thank God that he gave Thomas the opportunity to see. You know, the Bible said you have not because you asked. A lot, a lot of times I believe we miss a lot of blessings in life because we simply don't ask for these things in particular. So he said unto Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Well, what a blessing. You know, Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas. <laughs> Thomas was a good man. Uh, Sometimes we fail God in different areas. Thomas was a godly man. Thomas loved God. He loved the Lord. Not much said about him in the, uh, the scriptures as he was one of those that walked with the Lord. But he just, he didn't have to thrust his hands or his fingers into the uh, prints, uh, not prints, but actually the wounds that were on the hand of Christ. He didn't have to put his hand aside. Boy, when he saw him, he said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Now here's where I want to take a text. We're going to Peter. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Isn't, isn't that a blessing? But look what he said. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. We find that in 1 Peter. We'll go there just for a moment. I, I thank God as we tie these. 1 Peter 1 8, I'll just read it to you. Whom having not seen, you love. All right? I want to deal this morning with whom having not seen, you love. I've never seen the nail pierced hands of my Lord. Never seen him. I've never seen that wound in his side. Never seen it. Boy, hey, I'll see him when I get to heaven. You go to chapter number 5 of the book of Revelation. By the way, it's laid out in chronological order. Uh, verse number 19, chapter number 1, said the things that have been, that's the past, the things are. That was chapter 2 and 3, the church age, and the things which shall be hereafter. Find a rapture to the church in verse no, chapter number 4. You don't see Antichrist revealed to chapter 6. Uh, but at the same time, when you get to heaven, the Bible says that we will see him as a lamb slain. One day I will see them. But I've never seen them here. 
I've never seen his person. I've never walked with the physical Christ. I've never handled him. As you find in 1 John chapter number 1, they said we have, whom we have handled. Amen. They had laid hands on Christ. I, I've never had that privilege to do that. But I have seen Christ. One, I've seen him through the Word of God. We'll look at that in a few moments. I've seen him through the Word of God. You've never seen him. Nobody in our lifetime has the last one to ever see Jesus Christ was John the Revelator at about 95 years old, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and he heard a voice behind him and turned and saw the glorified Christ. That was the last person who has ever seen Christ. You hear a lot of people, oh, I saw 700 foot church. Listen, these people draw multitudes. Foolishness. We have not seen him, and yet I have seen him this morning through the Word of God. I've seen him through his precious Spirit of God that speaks to my heart with that small, still voice. I believe the record given over in 1 John chapter number 5. The Bible said, and this is the record. I believe the gospel this morning. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Hey, if you know you're saved tonight, you ought, uh, this morning, you ought to be happy with this. Amen. Never seen it. Thank God one day I will. Amen. For we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That's when, that's when He comes for us. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Dead in Christ going to rise first. Then we which are alive, that means saved, that word is quickened. And remain, that means you had not died yet. We're going to be called up in the clouds. We're going to be called up in the air to meet him. Uh, boy, boy, what a blessed day that is. I thank God this morning that I have placed my faith in something that is finished. Yeah. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. Not by works. Boy, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. talks about it's not of works it's of faith I thank God that I have seen the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ Romans dealt with it this way that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead that is the capstone of the gospel Thomas had to see but I believed and have not seen you know, the world kind of thinks I'm a schizophrenic, I guess. I've often used that. By the way, you can turn on over to 1 Peter. I talk to somebody that's invisible and somebody talks to me that doesn't exist. That's, the way the, hey, that's what the world thinks. Amen. Do you spend any time walking around talking to the Lord? <laughs> Man, I love mowing a yard. Hmm? I can't hear anybody. Get on that old John Deere lawnmower and I just mow and I talk to God. Barbara, look out there and my mouth's are running 90 miles an hour. I'm talking to him. He's talking to back to me. Hey, I'm not schizophrenic. You can leave your butterfly net at the house. You don't have to uh, put me in a straight jacket and start feeding me things to calm me down this morning. I thank God that I've seen him. That's why when you get, look at verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter 1. Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, I love Christ this morning. And by the way, that love is a reciprocal love. John, 1 John chapter 4 said we love Him because He first loved us. Aren't you glad that He loved you before you ever loved Him? I fell in love with him. Somebody said, why did Barbara marry you? I said, she couldn't help it. Amen. Huh? I fell in love with her the first time I ever saw her. She was 14. I was 14. She's almost 13. She sue me. Amen. Just sue me. Going to be 62 years next month. First time I ever met her. Fell in love with a little black hair girl. Did you know her hair used to be black? She was born blonde. It turned red. It turned auburn. It turned coal black. And it did not turn in the rinse. 
She's had about every color on the spectrum. Then it went to salt and pepper. And then it went to a lot of salt and a little bit of pepper. And finally, there was no pepper in it. And every now and then, you see a black hair come up in there. Fell in love with her. Listen, I thank God in 76, I fell in love with Jesus Christ. Never fell out of love with him. Loved him, boy. Hey, I've loved him for a lot of years right now. It's a reciprocal love. It's a separating love. Over in Matthew said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Listen, if you love things more than you love God, he said, You're not even worthy of me. He loves us beyond a fault this morning. It's a separating love, it's an obedient love. John 14 said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. It's an obedient love. Uh, sometimes I, I, God has to spank me. You ever get spanked? If you haven't been spanked, you better go check up. <laughs> hey, I never spanked my neighbor's kids. I wanted to. Man, we'd eat supper and they all lined up at the glass doors peering through watching us eat. So I came up with the idea of putting a chain link fence all around the property and I measured that thing off and they come and put a chain link fence up. And before they got it up, those kids were sitting on the top of the fence. <laughs> Spent a lot of money. Yeah. It's an obedient love. We obey. It's a constraining love. Paul said this, the love of Christ constraineth us. Our love for Christ is a suffering love. The love of Christ. Though He's faceless, He's not baseless. And I thank God for that. I just want to take these verses very quickly this morning and run down through them. I want to do like Dr. Seitler did. Dr. Seitler, last time I heard Dr. Seitler preach, I wrote in my Bible, remember dummy. He would read you a text it may be chapter uh, verse 5, it may be 7, it may be 10. He'd read his text, and then he would say, now let's look at verse number 1. A lot of people equate him with a lot of shouting and running. I'll tell you one thing. He devoured that Word of God and fed it to his people, and he would expositorily go through 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. How do you get to verse number 8? You get to verse number 8 by starting in verse number 1. Why do we love him so much? I fell in love with him and got saved, but that love has been a growing love over the years. I love him more now than I did them because I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to love. Same thing in marriage. You learn how to love your wife. You learn how to love your husband. You've got to learn that. Why? Barbara is the absolute polar opposite of me. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm out here and she's sitting back there. I show friendliness and she don't. <laughs> huh? I try to get her to nod her head. Nod your little head, shake your little. She just sits there and looks at me. She don't show no friendliness at all. Amen. You say, well, she knows what you're preaching. She has no idea what I was going to preach this morning. She had no idea. But I'm talking about love. You look expositorily. Let's look at verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What, what's he talking about? He's writing to dispersed Jews that he is trying to get them on page with the New Testament. They know Christ, but they still, they look back at the temple, they look back at the nation of Israel. Israel doesn't want them because they hook up with Gentiles. The unsaved don't want them because they hook up with Christ. Here they are for the first time. They're disinherited completely and he spends his time. That's why when you get to the book of Ephesians, you can break it down. Just two major things, verses uh, chapters 1 through 3, we find our position in Christ. Then chapters 4 through 6, we find the practical aspect of Christianity. Now that we're in Christ, how do we live? The Bible is very simple to understand. It's not, it's not a hard book. It's not a tough book. So he's writing to these dispersed Jews. 
Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How were they elect? Through sanctification of the Spirit, under obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. A lot of times, hey, why? They're already there. What the Bible does a lot of times, it looks from the other end back to where they are and, and, and what it took to get them there. So when you reverse it, you find it. You find the sprinkling of the blood, then obedience to the gospel. The Spirit sets you aside and then you enter into election. What's elect? Not you, the church. He's, he, you never find the word elect with anybody singular other than Jesus Christ. It's always we and us. He's talking about a body. You enter into election when you enter into salvation. Then you become into the elect that's going to heaven with him. Amen. But he showed up something here. He said grace and peace be multiplied. Why do we love God? One, because of his marvelous grace. Marvelous. Grace, grace. Boy, what a blessing. What is grace? Grace and mercy, I'll deal with both of them. They're different. Grace means that God gives you something you don't even deserve. I get to go to heaven this morning and I don't deserve it. I deserve hell. And I tell God, at my very best, I am not fit for the kingdom of God and neither are you. It's grace. Grace, grace, grace. Mar God's marvelous grace is mar. I love Him because He's got, He's got something waiting for us that our eye hath not seen, our ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into our hearts. You say, "Well, I know what it says in Revelation twenty-two." Well, I do too, but boy, that is not even surface. Thank God for grace. I'm glad I'm not going to heaven because I deserve it. I'm going to heaven because God gives it to me. Amen. Hey, that goes along with your salvation. There's a real hell and a real heaven, and I get to go to the real heaven. In Sunday school, we dealt with that, the heaven of the heavens. There's three heavens. You've got your atmosphere, you've got your celestial heaven, then you've got the heaven of heavens. That's where God resides. So we find because of His grace, grace and mercy are different. Why? Mercy means you do not get what you deserve. Grace means you get what you do not deserve and they run together. Thank God I'm not getting what I deserve. We also find a peace in verse number 2. He said grace unto you and peace, but he used the terminology be multiplied. I've had a peace in my soul now for many years. Since 1976, I thank God for the night I got saved. I, I, I got peace with God that night. Then I got peace of God. Sometimes that's fleeting at times with all of us. We get a little discommodulated about things sometimes. We get a little bit upset. We look around uh, how things are going. Things aren't going well, folks. They can get up there and paint all the pretty pictures they want to paint up there in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I'll tell you one thing. It costs you a mint to live. But I thank God that He gave me a peace that passeth all understanding. Thank God. Hey, I'm talking about I love Him for the peace that He instilled. I'm not upset. I don't like what's going on. And you say, well, who's going to win the election? God knows. But I'll tell you what, either way, I'm going to pop popcorn. Yes, sir. <laughs> We're going to find out how this nation goes. Again, the Senate tells you the heart of the nation, and it's been split 50 50 for a long time. You've got as many ungodly as you've got people that are conservative. I, I that, hey, don't want to get in politics, but thank God for His glorious peace. Look in verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Aren't you glad this morning you got a living hope? <laughs> huh? Why? Why? Because I live, he said, you may live also. <laughs> and I thank God this morning, he's alive. Amen. He is alive. And he said, I'm alive forevermore. <laughs> One day, I'm going to wake up dead. 
Had a man one time, he said his brother went to sleep last night and that, night, that morning he woke up dead. Everybody laughed about his terminology. Listen, you're going to wake up dead. You're going to wake up to a reality that, friend, you're not a dog. You're not a cat. You don't die like a dog. You're going to wake up to a reality that your life is an eternal life if you're saved or you're lost. When God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life, He gave him literally the breath of the life of God. He placed that into him and he became an immortal being. Thank God for His great salvation, the mercy of God that reached down farther than I could ever reach up. He came to me when I could not and when I would not come to Him. Did you know God would come knock on your heart? He said in a Revelation, He said, Behold, I stand at the door. Is He knocking this morning? You say, Well, I'm not going to answer the door. He, if, it, hey, if He's knocking this morning, He just answers the door. Be the best move you ever made in your life. Then in verse number 4, we love Him because of our prospect. Look what He said. From the dead to something. Aren't you glad you saved from something to something? <laughs> I'm glad He brought Israel out to take them in. Huh? God didn't just save us from something. God saved us to something. He deals with it a little bit here, to an inheritance. Ha! Ooh, boy, doesn't that sound good? Now, in order for you to have an inheritance, somebody had to die. Christ died. You say, what are we going to inherit? We're going to inherit everything that He had. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. <laughs> ah, you talk about a thrill this morning. You talk about an inheritance. How do you like uh, get a get a, a letter through the mail from a lawyer's office, and it says this is a law office of so and so, and such and such testator died, and they left an inheritance to you. And if you come in the office, we'll just set it down, and you walk in there, and he'll say, "I want you to sit down. I don't want you to stand up. I want you to sit down." You had a great great uncle you never knew about that was a multi-billionaire. And you're the only one that's going to inherit it. Can you imagine just falling out into the floor? Do an inheritance. Notice what he said, incorruptible. Not going to corrupt. It's still waiting for you and never corrupt. Undefiled and that faded not away. I like that and faded not away. When you get to the book of Revelation, chapter number 29, you have a series of no mores. But I like what the Lord said in the Bible, Behold, I make all things new. Now, what's new? Now, if a heaven is an eternal moment, and I believe it is, you'll have no time, no months, days, weeks, years, no hours, minutes. God has no time. God has all time, and God will end time. That means you can get everything you want to be done in a second of eternity. I'm talking about they're not going to be in the time there. But he uses the terminology and that fadeth not away. When we buy new toys and new things, after a while we get used to them. All right? uh, Barbara told me you need to get you a John Deere lawnmower. I said my old one works. She said you're going to be too old to run one when you buy it. So I said okay. I, I, I'm good with that. I enjoy that thing. But you know what? It's not like the first time when they pulled that big truck up there and they unloaded that thing down and we rode around on the driveway a little bit in that thing. You know, brand new. You remember when you bought that brand new car had all them tinker toys? You still don't know how to run them all? That's why you got a book that thick. That's for the electronic division that you've got on that automobile. But, hey, I, I go through them and uh, boy, I, I'm, I'm one of them I don't like instructions. I'm very, I, I like to do it myself. I like to mess up all by myself before I go back and take everything apart and put it back together in the right way. Hey, I'm talking about it'll never fade. It'll be new every time you see it forever. The first glimpse that faded not away. Hey, I'm going to be saved us to something. In verse number five, we find a blessed assurance who are kept by the power of God. 
through faith. Aren't you glad you're forever saved? I can't lose it. I can't give it away. I can't walk away from it. I was born in May the 15th, 1948 of Archie D. and Hilda E. Johnston. And listen, they've been gone for years. I will always be theirs. My DNA is their DNA. Thank God I've got the DNA of God this morning. Amen. Hey, He gives unto us something, but He gives you a blessed assurance who are kept by the power of God. I don't know what's going to transpire, but I know one thing. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You say, well, things are going downhill. They're going to keep on. They'll wax worse and worse. We may get a little bit of reprieve. I call it revival in the midst of the years. We get a little bit of reprieve a little while. It's kind of like winter. What you're looking at out here now, it's not as hot as it was. Every time you have storms come through, the temperature drops a little bit. It'll raise up a little bit, but not to where it was back here. What you're doing, you're slowly going down in your temperature. It's just a little at a time, a very small thing. I thank God that what I have gives me blessed assurance Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. I've been washed in His blood. Amen. Hey, you get assurance. Six and seven, you get wisdom. Hmm? What is wisdom? It's the right application of knowledge. You learn, you get wisdom by applying it, you get understanding, that's engineering. Now you've got the knowledge, you can apply it. Engineering, understanding, you know what makes it work. Now you can tweak it. Huh? Look what he said in verse 6. When you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. Let me tell you, seasons change. I'm on top today, but I may have a kidney stone. To, oh, don't say that. Oh, whew. Every time I say I might have something, I end up with it. Amen? Seasons change. We're getting ready to go into a seasonal change. Now notice what he said. Though now for a season, if need be, why do you have problems in life? Because you need them. Oh, you didn't know that, did you? Did you know God controls your future? God could take all the bad out of your life. God could take all the sickness out of your life. God could take all the disappointment out of your life. God does it. I don't take everything out of my children's life. They've got to learn just like I had to learn. I found out a long time ago you cannot buy experience. Life is experiential. Now notice what he said. If need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Look at verse 7. That. Now, why? That the trial of your faith. I saw one time a man wrote in his Bible, a faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. Now you've got faith in God. Now you're going to have a testing of that faith. Boy, this door swings on the hinges of resistance over here. Every time you go forward and try to open a door, you're going to find resistance to that. Or look, look at what he said. He said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Who had rather have a heartache than a hundred pounds of gold? I want you to notice what God just said. This is the Bible, right? That your trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. I'm talking about 24 plus carat. Might be. I like that might be. When you see a might be, then you might not be. God, God, God has an end game, all right? When I say an end game, what He's doing through life, He's trying to get you to a certain place. With everybody, it's different. Some people he's got to put through harder trials because they're harder headed, maybe. I, I don't know. I, I tell people God never put a lot of problems on me as a pastor because he knew I couldn't take it. I'd go home and cry. Now I go home and take a half a baby aspirin and I lay down and I sleep nine and a half hours without getting out of that bed, son. I, hey, I, that ain't bad for 76. Now notice what he said. 
might be found unto praise. You'll praise Him and honor. You'll honor Him and glory and you'll glorify Him at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And infinite wisdom. Look in verse number 8. Whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see Him not yet believing, <laughs> you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hey, I don't know about you this morning. I'm happy this morning. I'm having a good time preaching. Amen. You say, well, I don't like your preaching. Well, I don't like it either, but I don't have to listen to it. Do you know I don't ever listen to my messages? I turn them on long enough to make sure the sound's right. I never have liked that guy. I don't know what it is about him. Maybe, maybe he looks like me, but he's the evil twin over here on the other side of me. Hey, I'm talking about joy on Speakable and full of glory. Do you have the joy of the Lord that Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is your strength? Huh? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Listen, smile a while and give your face a rest. Put a smile on your face. You're going to work, say I'm having a bad day. They don't have to know that. You know why? They don't really care. They're waiting around to tell you how bad a day they're having. Amen. Hey, that's just that. I tell people don't ever invite someone to your pity party because they'll mess it up telling you how bad their day's been. Joy unspeakable. And then verse number 9, which I didn't read a while ago. Look at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith. Today I walk by faith. I've never seen Christ. I've never seen the nail-pierced hands or the side. I've never touched him physically, never handled him, never heard his voice literally speak to me. I've never sat around a campfire with him at night. My heart never burned within me as they did on the road to Emmaus. All oh, our hearts burned within us when they heard him speak the word of God to them. But I thank God for something. I have seen him. What is the end game? Even the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, the prophets inquired and diligently about them. I thank God that the one who loved me and died for me one day will take me forever to live with the Lord. I love the last part the first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 18. 13 through 18 deal with the rapture of the church, death. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Where are you going to be? Let's stand this morning. We're going to have an invitation. You need to come, you come. You need to come this morning, you come. I thank God for Calvary. Calvary covered it all. He took my place. But I thank the Lord I've seen Him through the Word of God. I've seen Him through the lens of the Bible. 